Eight. Um, okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is the first meeting of the, this interim of the Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Uh, welcome to my co-chairman, Senator Smith. Uh, would like to announce that we do have uh, Miss Emily Wiley. She is a graduate fellow and she's going to be uh, working with us for the entire year. So Emily, welcome and we're glad to have you. And uh, I'm sure if you learn something, it'll be from Senator Smith and probably not me. So, uh, so at this time, we'd like to call our meeting to order. Ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Senator Chambers Armstrong. Here. Senator Carpenter. Senator Mills, Here. Senator Schickel, Here. Senator Southworth, Here. Senator Turner, Here. Senator Webb, Here. Senator Westerfield, Senator Wheeler, Senator Williams. Here. Representative Bauman. Present. Representative Blanton. Here. Representative Bowling. Here. Representative Bridges. Here. Representative Burke. Here. Representative Chester Burton. Here. Representative Dossett. Representative Dotson. Representative Flannery. Here. Representative Fugate. Representative Gentry. Here. Representative Grossberg. Here. Representative Johnson. Here. Representative McCool. Representative Miles. Representative Smith. Here. Representative Wesley. Here. Representative White. Here. Representative Williams. Co-Chair Smith. Present. And Co-Chair Gooch. Here. Okay, we do have a quorum, and uh, so we're uh, not that we'll have any votes today. Uh, but we do have at the end of the end of the meeting, we have some uh, administrative regulations that have been referred to us from uh, um, the uh, Fish and Wildlife. There's no actually no uh, action required on those, but if somebody does have some questions or whatever, we're more than happy to uh, get you know take time to get those answers for you. Uh, at this time, I say I've already called the meeting to order. Uh, we ask that, uh, uh, that people from uh, American Electric Power and, and Kentucky Power uh, would come and, and address uh, to the committee uh, some issues that, uh, uh, like all issues, they, they, they uh, impact our rate payers. Uh, we do have kind of a monopoly system in Kentucky and anything that, uh, whether there was a, a, a sale or whatever is uh, uh, very important. We did have the situation where the uh, proposed sale of Kentucky Power to American Electric uh, Power to Liberty uh, Utilities, I think, did not happen. And uh, so I think what we want to do is we ask, I ask those, these ladies to come and uh, kind of give us an idea on maybe why that didn't happen and what we're looking at next. Um, and so with that, uh, we have uh, Cindy Wiseman, who's President and Chief Operating Officer of Kentucky Power, and Amy Ellett, uh, the External Affairs Manager for Kentucky Power. So ladies, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ah, now it's more There green. you go, that's much better. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, as Chairman Gooch said, I'm Amy Elliott. I have worked with Kentucky Power for the last 15 years. 10 of those I spent in regulatory compliance and rates, and the last five have been in external affairs. But we are excited for the opportunity to be here today. Um, it's been an eventful few years for Kentucky Power, and we always appreciate when you take interest in matters that affect our company because we recognize that they also affect your constituents. So, you know, this last session, we were able to work together on Senate Bill 192 on securitization, which was positive legislation for our customers. And we sincerely appreciate that and want to thank you for your work on that. Otherwise, Cindy Wiseman is here with me. She is our President and Chief Operating Officer. Um, many of you all probably know Cindy from her years in customer service and external affairs, but our team is very excited that she is taking on um, the President role in Kentucky. So with that, we'll get started. Oh yeah, that's my job. Thank you. Uh, also, 
also like to add my thanks to all, each of you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I am very new in my role. Once we announced the termination of the cell, I was named uh, the president and COO. Many of you may have known Brett Madison, who was in the um, position before us, and he's still with AAP, but went back to Louisiana, his home state, to head up a company there. Um, I have been with um, AEP for 15 years on the Appalachian Power side for 10 years, and then most recently in Kentucky Power for five years. I'm based in Ashland. And I have covered um, in my past role external affairs, customer service, communications, and economic development. And now, of course, have responsibility for the uh, company. We have a good team in place. Um, I hope I'm a familiar face to you all. I intend to finish my career at Kentucky Power. Um, that's my plan anyway. We'll see what, what all happens. Um, but I know one of the reasons that you wanted us to come today is to talk a little bit about what's been going on for the past two years, and there's been a lot of activity, um, and you all have been um, a part of that and aware of the, um, the sale that has been taking place. It started about two years ago when AEP announced a strategic review of Kentucky Power. And then through uh, various regulatory requirements at the state and then the federal level um, in December, it was approved at the state level, but then in December it was denied by, the, uh, by FERC, the federal uh, regulators. And then the two companies decided to refile for approval. But there was no single reason why the sale was terminated, uh, except that the time that it was taking, uh, as I said, you know, coming up on two years, and then the hurdles at the federal level to get it um, passed or across the finish line. So um, on April 17th, I think we made you all aware that the two parties agreed to uh, terminate the sale uh, from AEP of Liberty of Kentucky's assets. And so today we uh, remain part of AEP. Um, as one of our employees said to me recently, he said, for a while it seemed like everything was changing and it was, you know, we were working on getting the sell and then, um, and now nothing has changed. And so we're part of, we remain part of AEP. AEP is committed to Kentucky Power and its customers. Um, and we're, you know, working on um, a short term and a long term strategy to continue serving our customers as we, as we move forward. Um, it's been about seven weeks, so we have some work to do. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about what, you know, what we're uh, thinking about. So um, it's not news to anyone. On, I have the slide up on the regional situation. It's not news to anyone that we have challenges in eastern Kentucky, which is also affecting the financial health of Kentucky Power. Uh, we've lost more than 11,000 customers in the past 15 years in our territory. Um, you can, and that trends with the population loss for eastern Kentucky. And you can look at, at data and you can see where other areas of the state are, are growing and gaining in population. So uh, generally speaking, cells represent the denominator in utility rate making and thus load of, uh, loss of load directly correlates to increased rates for remaining customers. Uh, that, that was a mouthful, but you know, our cost to serve is higher um, because we have fewer customers per square, square mile and per line mile. And then we have what you hear us talk about our fixed costs, and those are spread among the entire customer base. So as we lose customers and we lose load, that has a negative impact on rates. So compounding these challenges, um, our customers are using, our customers in Kentucky Power are using more electricity than the national average, in some ways 50% more. And I think that's due to housing and the heating and cooling systems that they use, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. And then of course, with inflation and, and post-COVID, uh, everything is more expensive. Our costs have gone up too for um, equipment, transformers, and things like that. So we are under this constant challenge. It's a daily conversation about how we balance uh, in Eastern Kentucky, keeping the lights on, investing in infrastructure, you know, upgrading substations, replacing poles, transmission facilities, uh, versus how that transfers in rates and what customers can, can tolerate in rates. So that is something that is I'm pretty passionate about and I'm 
uh, trying to work on every day. I mean, it, it is, uh, we're acutely aware of the circumstances that we, that we have. Um, as I mentioned, we're working on a short-term and long-term strategy. Uh, we break this down on, in the presentation. I promise we're going to be quick. But the, um, in the short term, we're securitizing the large portion of rate base. Uh, again, Amy mentioned it, but we can't thank you enough for uh, being able to work with you and partner. Um, your leadership on getting securitization past the finish line for us is, was a great tool, and uh, we welcome future opportunities like that, too. It was very refreshing. Uh, we're looking at low-income programs that we may be able to do to, to help our customers. We already provide a lot of community support. We're committed to continuing that under what I've referred to as Kentucky Power 2.0. Um, in the long term, we have, um, you know, we're a leader in economic development in eastern Kentucky already and certainly plan to continue that and looking for ways to elevate or escalate our efforts in that area. So always open to ideas about that or a discussion about that. We, we are uh, in, in that for the long term. And then energy efficiency, uh, we'll mention that too, but we're looking at ways when I mentioned housing and and what we're seeing as far as usage, uh, ways we can make an impact there. And then, um, you know, as I said, I'm not, I don't come from a regulatory or finance or even a legal background. I'm a customer background. And so uh, relationships are really important to me and I'm looking for ways to partner. And I've uh, been meeting with anybody and everybody and willing to do so to try to generate some new ideas and solutions on how we can help not just uh, our customers, but Eastern Kentucky as a whole. In the short term, um, I, you know, I just I want you all to know, and I've said it already, that we're doing everything we can to work with customers and to mitigate rates. Um, we are examining all of our customer programs. We've formed um, a couple of work groups with, internally with employees. They're mostly our field employees who don't they don't have the benefit of sitting behind a desk all day and coming up with uh, solutions and making decisions, but they have these great ideas on ways that we can help our customers because they're the ones interacting with them. So we've got these work groups going internally. We're also looking for uh, the possibility of increasing our Heart and Fall program, which are our two winter assistance programs. Uh, if there's a way that we can get more customers um, to receive the benefit of that, we would like to pursue that. And then we are focusing efforts on housing and hunger. I mean, we can't solve those as a power company but certainly we're willing to be a partner in that and willing to do our part in that too. And when I, you know, the one thing I wanted to add is, um, you know, we're, tr we're trying to interact differently with our customers too. Um, you probably won't see um, a lot of advertisement, a lot of billboards down Highway 23 or anything like that about us. We're, you know, we found that we can segment our customers out and so we have a group of customers who are on life support so we reach out to them because they have a special need apart from the customer who just pays his or her bill and goes on every day so we're doing a lot of um, outreach in that way one of the challenge to be quite frankly uh, frank is that we're finding is that uh, getting them to interact back with us you know the majority of customers just pay their bill and go on about their lives but it's that 10 or 15 percent that has trouble that we're trying to uh, impact and reach and it's you know the challenge is just getting them to uh, participate with us but we're we're continuing to do that and so one of the one of the other changes that we are hoping to make is to change our due date from 15 to 21 days we are sensitive to the financial hardships that our customers are experiencing and want to use all the tools that we can to mitigate um, their, their hardships that they have in paying their bills. Um, and, you know, one of those big tools will be securitization. It's, it's already been announced that we will file a rate review later this summer. Our plan is to file the case at the same time that we file the securitization filing with the PSC. So the day that the securitization bill becomes effective, I'm, I'm not a lawyer either, but I think it's June 29th, um, it was past the session, we will make the securitization filing with the PSC. But you know, we wanna be clear when we say that, that there are savings with securitization and that we will maximize those benefits, but you know, the, the case will still be an increase. 
but because of the company's ability to use securitization, um, the rate impact will be reduced. And securitization actually benefits customers in two ways. So there are savings that will be recognized from reduced financing costs, but there's also the ability to spread costs over a longer period. So we have about $80 million in storm cost that we've experienced in the last few years. You all have heard about the ice storms and the flooding in Eastern Kentucky, but because of securitization, we'll be able to spread those costs over the 20 year life of the securitization bond instead of recovering them in the normal way of three years. So we would normally spread the $80 million over three years. So, you know, once again, securitization will really be helpful Hank, for our me, customers. Can I ask you of a question course. related yeah. to that? Yeah. Um, I, I know you had the uh, storm cost, uh, whether they be floods or, or whatever. Um, is Are those types of losses insurable? Or, uh, and, and if so, did you have insurance or uh, just what about that? So, no, unfortunately, they're not. I don't know of utilities. I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, of course, but I don't know of utilities that have insurance for those types of losses. Um, we did at the time explore to see if there were any programs to help with recovery, and we were unable to find those. Thank you. Yeah, I think acts of nature generally are not, you know, covered. And, and the thing about securitization is that you know, we will file at the PSC and then we will um, pursue financing. So, um, you know, it, it may be into next year before we know what the, you know, outcome of all of that is. Um, moving on to our long-term goals, I mentioned economic development. Um, certainly, as I said, we're a leader in that area and um, intend to continue. And Amy's going to talk a little bit about economic development more in a minute. Um, and then partnering to help with housing and energy efficiency, um, and then expanding our demand side management programs. We have some plans around that as well. So along the lines of economic development, Kentucky Power revamped its efforts in 2012. And that was the same year that we hired Insight Consulting to perform a gap analysis to see what the region really needed. Because at that time, we weren't getting requests for information from industries looking to move to Eastern Kentucky. Um, in 2015, we developed the Kentucky Power Economic Growth Grant Program, and that allows us to spend about $800,000 a year that's dedicated to economic development. And it's used in the forms of um, workforce training, and site development, and then support of the local economic development agencies like Ashland Alliance and One East Kentucky. We also have two dedicated employees that spend most of their time working in economic development. Many of them, many of you know them. Bob Shirtliff is, is here today with us. And then Amanda Clark covers the Ashland area. Uh, likewise, Cindy and I have both received economic development training, but it's truly the long game. So we spend $800,000 a year on economic development, but the projects there are you know, sewer extensions to industrial parks or roads to industrial parks. We've worked on about seven industrial parks in Eastern Kentucky, and you know, our sites now are becoming business ready. And we've been fortunate this year um, our economic development team has responded to 20 RFIs, 20 requests for information from industry looking to locate in Eastern Kentucky. And that's $17 billion in projects. You know, we can't say how much of it will land in Eastern Kentucky, but, you know, it, we're, we're hopeful that, that some of it will. Um, one of the success stories that we have is the Hager Hill Industrial Site in Paintsville. That's a 15 acre site that through KPEG and through some other funding they have is site ready now. And it is, you know, it's being marketed and there is a potential tenant there. You would think with 20 RFIs, surely one of them will hit. <laughs> we're, hope, we're hopeful for that. And then, you know, we're also involved in, uh, you know, we work with SOAR and One East Kentucky and National Alliance and of course KED and the 
Abnet on all of our economic development projects to participate on their boards. Um, so one of the things I'm really becoming more and more passionate about, I've mentioned already, is, is housing and the housing stock that um, I think we have. I mean, it's hard to find really good data on the conditions and the situations, but, you know, we have found some through ARC. But um, I just have a lot of concerns about what we are seeing in electric usage. Um, there are, you know, we have our share of customers who are living in older homes, um, small modular homes. And, you know, I'll give you an example of um, a customer this past um, winter in January. She uh, lives in a, a single wide trailer in Ashland. And uh, she's one of those that had a $900 power bill. But it was because she used over 6,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. And I challenge any of you to look back at your power bills, and I promise you, you're not using that much unless you're living in a mansion. Um, there, you know, the average customer in Kentucky Power uses 1,300 kilowatt hours. This customer used over 6,000 kilowatt hours, and so anything she's heating with, and she, she and, and I don't know her circumstances if she's a renter um, or not, but anything she's heating is going right back out sod in the you know in the heart of winter and so there are heating source issues you know strip heating um, uh, portable heating and you know a, a portable heater can can cause your bill to jump 50 bucks in a month just like that so um, I, I'm I'm saying all this because it is a real issue for us and uh, while we can't change all of the housing in the in eastern Kentucky we're certainly committed to helping and supporting that and again um, welcome I did I mean I know there are some initiatives underway um, in that area but uh, we can't do enough to help with housing and then on the energy efficiency side and so what we can do Kentucky Power is uh, we have just completed a market study to reintroduce energy efficiency programs uh, back to our customers. Uh, that requires regulatory approval and will take place over the next year. Uh, we'll seek for approval to roll those in over the next two or three years. Uh, but that, that, those will be tools that we can use um, to help customers, both residential and our commercial, our business customers. And you know, we have customer service folks who, who visit our customers at their homes if they request it and um, so this is a, an excellent tool if we could have those back so that so energy efficiency is a big deal for us that is something that we can have an impact on um, but housing is a um, is an even bigger deal so that actually brings us to the end of our uh, our slide deck and so I just want to close with to let you know that we're acutely aware of the uh, systemic issues in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, and as I said, we're trying to do everything we can to balance what we invest in infrastructure with rates. Um, it's a daily discussion at our company. And we are committed to helping in these areas and housing, energy efficiency, rate mitigation, making contributions. We've made uh, just in the housing alone probably over $300,000 to housing agencies from through our AEP Foundation in the past few years and plan to do more. Um, we have employees who are volunteering in these areas and we plan to do more of that too. And then always at top of mind is improving reliability and safety for our customers and of course our employees. Again, we thank you for allowing us to be here today. Okay, let me, I have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned that your, you know, your, your, I guess, uh, your sales are down because people have migrated from much of East Kentucky, so the demand is less. Mm -hmm. What what percent did you say it was down? Our, last? So we've lost about eleven thousand, more than eleven thousand customers in fifteen years, and then our sales are down nearly twenty six percent. Of course, you have to take into consideration that could have been like the loss of AK Steel the loss of Belfont Hospital, some of these large load customers, mining customers. Coal, coal mines coal are, mines are, are, are a huge load, as, right. As well. uh, what percent of the power that you are supplying to uh, 
your customers at Kentucky Power, what percent of that is generated in the state of Kentucky? Well, we have our big Sandy plant, which is about 300 megawatts, 295 megawatts. I don't know what the exact percentage is, but that, and then we own 50% ownership of the Mitchell plant, which is a coal fire plant, but in West Virginia. We will be uh, out of that in 2028, as it stands right now. And, you know, we have a, uh, before the commission right now, we have an integrated resource plan being reviewed. It's our IRP. That's what commissions or utilities are required to file every three years. And that's the 15-year look at what we think our generation needs are. Um, I'm not sure the exact percentage of what we produce. I mean, we do purchase power off the market, too. You know, we always pursue the least cost option for our customers is, is uh, you know, one of the criteria that we use. Yeah, but you're, I mean, you're going to, you're going to sell uh, what you're generating first. And then yes. if, if instead of going somewhere else, you're going to get the least cost option. If it means going to the grid, yeah. which timing is, uh, is pretty much determinative of whether it's going to be cheaper or not. Um, what percent do you have a, do you have a, on your average, uh, that you're, uh, that you're generating and you're selling to your customers, do you have a breakdown of what the sources are? Like what percent is coal? What percent is natural gas? What percent is other sources, be it hydro, uh, wind, solar, whatever? So Kentucky doesn't have wind or solar or hydro. We have coal and gas in our, you know, we're pursuing, I don't know what the exact percentages are. I don't either. Point, but we have, um, you know, we, we have intentions, you know, as we move forward, because we do need to acquire, especially with, with our Mitchell expiration in 2028, we need to um, acquire some new generations. So in our IRP that I mentioned, we're looking at, uh, a, you know, increased gas, perhaps extending the life of Big Sandy Plant, um, uh, building a, a, another gas plant or a coal, a CT or a CC, a coal a combustion turbine, or and then also uh, renewables. Okay. The last statistic that I saw for Kentucky as a whole, you know, not Kentucky Power specific, was that, and I don't, I'm not sure where I read it, but I think it was 71 percent of electricity was still coming from coal. Is that your company or is that that's, statewide? That's statewide. That's statewide. That's what I thought. See, 69 or 70, 71%. Yeah. We can get the numbers, though, and, okay. and Please see do if we that. can Please do. get okay. back percentages. That, that would be good for uh, for us to have. Um, during the, uh, uh, I guess, the situation we had in late December, around December the 23rd, 4th, 5th, whatever, mm -hmm. did you uh, force any customers to – uh, turn off their electricity, or did you have any brownouts associated with that event for customers in Kentucky Power? Uh, luckily, we did not. We but we were part of PJM, and so PJM did issue um, a call to conserve electricity and asked all of the utilities in the PJM footprint to do the same. So we did send out messages to customers. Um, I think it started literally in the middle of the night heading into Christmas Eve and we uh, had a call to conserve I think through the late evening of Christmas Eve or maybe the very early morning of Christmas Day um, but fortunately we were you know we avoided any kind of uh, outages in our in our territory. The, the one thing I would add to that is that most of the utilities in the state have an interruptible service tariff Yes. which allows customers to pay lower rates throughout the year um, so that they can be interrupted in these times where you know there doesn't seem to be enough energy in the market. And I think we had three or four that may have been interrupted for a brief period of time, but they received the benefit of lower rates and that they expected that they would be interrupted. Yeah, and, good point. Yeah. So yeah, and probably. those are industrial customers, you know, that, right. that maybe even uh, they weren't probably operating at full speed over the Christmas holiday. Uh, we in, in, in West Kentucky, uh, we had some situations where there actually were uh, brownouts. Uh, and, uh, you know, you uh, 
I know that uh, some of the other industrials, such as coal mines that were operating, um, were warned that they could have to pay a lot more if they didn't cut back. And the problem with, uh, with that is that, you know, if you got people underground, you know, you could have right. three or four or 500 people working, uh, but even if it's two or 300 and they're underground, it takes time to get those people out. You can't just shut off the power to those types of customers because, uh, uh, you know, you got fans that has to keep air going, that sort of thing. And so there, that was a dilemma for those folks. I'm not sure they should even be uh, eligible for any type of a, a tariff that would allow them to get low rates at one time because they wouldn't be able to meet that uh, demand on, on, the, on the other end. Um, but uh, my other question to you is, um, you know, we, we saw that for the first time ever, Kentucky had brownouts and blackouts, not specifically your utility, but, but others did. Uh, we had never experienced that before. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had been warned by uh, uh, MISO that the potential was there. Uh, and I think we might, uh, I think I've got some indications that PJM is saying that that may happen again in the, in the summer. So what we're seeing is that in many cases, our utilities can't meet the demand that they have now. And we are experiencing this huge shift in this country to electric vehicles that have to be plugged into the grid to get repowered. Uh, and recharged, uh, and certainly at the rate we're moving, there's no way that the grid is adequate or the generation is adequate get to meet that demand. Uh, but since you have experienced a 20 something percent, 26 percent decrease, um, do you still have excess capacity in, in that amount, or uh, have you shuttered generation or, or whatever to where you don't have that much? Uh, or in in the event that that shift does happen, well, will well, K will uh, Kentucky uh, Power be able to meet that increased demand uh, as we try to manage the shift to electric vehicles? You understand my question? Yeah. Yes, okay. I do. I, I mean, I think I think we've adjusted as we've gone along, but certainly we're in a position where we're ready to acquire new generation, and that's because of like the Rockport unit agreement that we had expired in December. That was another plant that we were getting power from. And then we have um, the Mitchell plant that expires in 2028, which I know is a few years away, but it's not that far away when you're talking about, you know, bringing on new generations. So we are um, working on that um, at, at a fast pace to bring to bring new generation in. I mean, we have the luxury of buying from the market if that's affordable. Um, and then, of course, we have our big Sandy plant. And then, you know, we still do have Mitchell, which is a pretty hefty coal-fired plant that provides a lot of generation for us. But uh, we'll be able to meet it. Um, certainly, uh, I know I, I know your concerns. And, and I think the biggest challenge with electric vehicles is, is not so much the load at this point. But for me, it's the infrastructure for, for charging. You know, we just don't have that in eastern Kentucky. Um, and so until we see more growth in that area, is, um, I talked to a, a, a car dealer in Ashland a couple weeks ago, and he has EVs for the first time in a showroom, but he, you know, he's not getting any, uh, he doesn't have demand for them yet. So, oh, but, um, but that's what we're hearing yeah, that right. the reason we're moving so fast is that the consumers are demanding it. Yeah. Well, I think they are in other parts. <laughs> I just don't think they're, I mean, they're certainly not demanding I don't them. think it's happening yeah. anywhere. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's just my opinion. Cindra <laughs> Smith, you have some questions. I do. I appreciate uh, the, the testimony today on the power company. And uh, I think I've said this before, we have a lot of new members on this committee, but you know, the power company for me is a part of a family. My, my mother worked there for almost 30 years and I spent a lot of time outside the, the office there in Hazard waiting for her to, to get off work uh, <laughs> so we could go home together. But that period of time is very much a family uh, atmosphere with the power company. We still have a lot of the old swag that we give out there, Christmas dinners and I was looking around to see if Senator Webb was in here. She remembers probably these days. But uh, so for me, it's a little bit uh, personal uh, having had that experience and being a part of that family. But 
as we go forward, uh, the thing we're tasked with here is that our job is to take care of the ratepayers, the people that elect us and send us down here for us to be able to sit in these chairs and represent them while they're at ball games or working at the, the, the Kroger or the different places at home so we can do that. And so that makes our job uh, pretty tough sometimes. But I just want to get to my point, and that is as I went back and read the FERC denial, one of the things that concerned me was that the question was repeatedly asked, uh, the, the impact that this sale, this merger would have on the ratepayer. And the reason for the denial, as it's listed here, was that that was never answered. So I'd like to give you all the chance to answer that for our committee, is that what would this merger have had the impact on the ratepayer? And now that this thing has, has gone by the wayside, what is the impact going to be now for the ratepayer? Well, well, so it was a, the impact on wholesale customers is what you know, FERC was concerned with. Um, I certainly can't answer that first question because um, I cannot speak for Liberty. I'm very much a Kentucky Power employee, and I wasn't even part of the conversations at the AEP level when this was going on. But um, as far as uh, future, um, I mean, I, I mean, I hope you heard that what we were talking about. We we do have to file a rate case at the end of June. We're doing everything we can to keep it as simple and as small as we can. And as we mentioned, the securitization is uh, is a good tool that we have to help mitigate rates. We're also uh, looking at you know other other ways that we can um, uh, ch change the rate impact. I mean, it's been three years since we've been in for a rate case. It may not feel like it to people, but you know, when I talk about usage, that's a big part of it. I mean, our rates are slightly higher in Eastern Kentucky than they are in other parts of the, to the rider, of right. the state, but um, the, the usage is a big issue for us. And so uh, I assure you we're gonna do everything we can. I can't tell you what the percentage is gonna be in this summer, or they're still working the numbers, or um, you know, because also we, you know, we file the rate case process is, is um, you know, we file a lot of testimony. We a answer hundreds, if not thousands, of questions about it. They look at everything. It's, you know, a, an audit of the entire company. And then there will be a hearing, most likely, later this year with rates going into effect January 1, 2024. That's the, that's the proposal. And, and let me further vet this out. I mean, so, I mean, rate cases, if this thing is granted, means increase in rates across eastern Kentucky and most of us are still trying to dig our way out of the flood and we've got churches that are sending us stuff I'd spoken to uh, a representative Fugit who's at a trail authority uh, meeting today and apologizes, mm -hmm. apologizes that he couldn't come and uh, his power bill I, I believe he says has gone up you know threefold from what they've seen before and we've got issues which we've brought and talked to you all before about people that don't have a home yet they have a power bill they've lost their home and their farm and can't even find the meter for most cases and we brought some of those to your all's attention so it's a pretty you know mixed bag for us back at home but to brush up my economics for us to help this to move forward it's either going to have to increase the the rates on those that have remained in east kentucky which is a uh, is, is not going to be a long-term approach for it. we're going to have to grow new industry uh, right. now unless there's another way out there that i've seen it i mean that's really how you tackle these two things and so we either keep increasing out of the people that are there and watching out migration of eastern kentucky that we're experiencing now, or we invest in economic development yep. and use these industrial parks as a tremendous might uh, for creating jobs. And we do that through energy, as we discussed yesterday in the committee. So uh, it is a tough, tough deal. But I echo the sentiments of the chairman, my cohort, cohort here, that I'm worried about the future of the rolling brownouts and where we're going to be to five to seven years with what I see right now, unless there's more information coming from the power company. But I'm concerned about what I see currently in East Kentucky and what our plan will be now that this merger has has uh, transitioned into what it is now. Are you all plan on staying or is it another sale in the wings? Mm -hmm. What should we sort of expect for those of us in East Kentucky that are, we don't plan on going anywhere, but we'd like to know what's coming. Yeah, well, I totally agree with you about the population drain and the economic development efforts. I mean, we, we need to find a way. I mean, we've lost in just um, the past two or three years about 2,000 customers 
So that does not have a good effect on rates, you know, when we spread those costs back over. So yes, and that's when I say when I'm pretty passionate about this, we've got to find a way to stop that population drain. If it would stabilize, that would help. If but we don't, my, my district is going to be the entire state of Kentucky. So we, <laughs> no. we're going to have to do something. Yeah, for, no. so. and, and then on top of, yeah, you all understand this even better than I do. But, um, but on top of that, we need we need economic development. Economic development is a long game. Eastern Kentucky got a late start in that area. And so that's why, like, our resources, our KPEG grant, we're putting into uh, site development and and those types of things. And then, um, and then third, your part about um, rate cases. I mean, they're the kind of the necessary evil, right? I mean, we that's how we have to, in, in order to keep the lights on, we have to make investments in infrastructure and add generation to our fleet and and upgrade substations and rebuild transmission towers that have been around for 70 years i mean that's that's part of it um and and as i've said several times already here today i'm acutely aware of what that impact has on rates i mean i've spent a lot of time talking to customers and understand the you know the challenges that we have. Yeah, and I'll just wrap up. I mean, I, I I hail from the coal fields of Eastern Kentucky, where we understand natural resources. We have yep. an abundance of it, and it's difficult for those of us from from this region to go back home and to go to the soccer field or go to a ball game and to see you'll see the miners that'll come up and they've got the evidence of a day's work on them. They're covered yep. in dirt and they're happy to have those jobs. Just recently you saw the, the coal miner that came to the UK ball game and it created a sensation, mm-hmm. which is surprising because it's very common. And, it, and it, I think it reflects the humility of a lot of the people that we serve. Yep. And yet they know their work is critically important to keeping the costs and the power on this country and to keeping those costs down. And yet this region specifically just keeps getting hammered and hammered and hammered with more and more loss. Like you said, people pouring out of the flood. We've been up here screaming to try to get housing to tell people don't leave. We have a plan. Uh, so I do think it's it's very, uh, um, I'm trying to think, of, I can't even think of the proper word, but it's incumbent upon you to really come up with a clear plan for us going forward that gives people some hope and industry hope about what's happening for us to stem this flow coming out of Eastern Kentucky and see that there is an opportunity to grow the jobs and spread this out instead of keep piling it on to people that can least afford it. Yeah. Um, so I do encourage you all to uh, be very clear about your intentions and your plans as you guys go forward. And uh, I appreciate the time that's been a lot of me to, to speak on this issue, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're very willing to do our part. I don't, you know, I don't know that we can solve all the problems of Eastern Kentucky, but we're certainly do, being able to impact what we can. And I didn't answer your question about the future of Kentucky Power, who will be owned by. And as, as far as I know, we're, um, we will remain with AEP. Um, you know, AEP has moved on, and I think they're, you know, they have announced that they're looking at. Um, some of the non-regulated renewable assets to sell. I mean, they're you know they're always reviewing their portfolio of assets, and so. Um, I but I I do not foresee us being sold in at least in the. I mean, I have no idea what the future brings, but you know, not in the near term at least. And one other question that you asked was about the customers that didn't have homes but got power bills. So I didn't want that one to slip by either. We did send a team of meter inspectors out you know, after the flooding and tried to identify all of those customers. But there were a few that, you know, for whatever reason, we didn't notice and they didn't notify us that they weren't living there. And, you know, that that process was was automatic that the bill went out. But as soon as they contacted us, we were able to work with those customers. Representative Wesley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I live in eastern Kentucky, and I, I just have a question. Uh, you, you mentioned about the usage, and um, a lot of elderly people has cut back due to their, their price and, and, or the cost on their electric bills, uh, six to $800 a month. Do you have a game plan for any of the elderly that's on fixed income uh, for what's, what's coming? Because right now, with the usage cutting back, they're paying six to eight hundred dollars. So, do you have anything in place, or going to have anything in place for them? Well, we we already have some programs in place that will help customers. I mean, those are along if they're struggling payment arrangements and extended payment plans. We have two budget programs that we try to 
try to get customers to take advantage of and that level you know that will levelize your bill for the year and just adjust a few dollars at a time that is a that is the best tool for our customers if they would if they would sign up for it it doesn't income doesn't matter anybody's eligible uh, that's where you don't get those winter spikes. I mean, we're a, a winter spiking company. We have, uh, you know, our highest bills are all, or winter peaking company. We're highest bills are in January, February, and March when we see those high bills. And like right now, they're they're really down. Um, so, and we don't adjust rates. That's just that's purely usage. You know, that customers are using more in the winter to heat their homes, so electric heating homes. Um, but going forward, yes, and as one of us mentioned, we're looking at. Uh, low income programs and what we can do. You know, we have assistance programs already in addition to what is available through LIHEAP and others, but we have the Heart and Thaw program too. But certainly, I mean, we've looked at a lot of different, you know, is there a low income tariff that we could offer if we could, you know, if it would be approved and if it makes sense? I mean, so yes, we're always looking for that and putting more attention to it now because we recognize there's in addition to the other problems in the in eastern Kentucky there's also an income problem you know when you hear people say that they're trying to live on $800 a month I mean take away all their bills I mean that's not a livable income so even if they didn't have to pay an electric bill I mean $800 a month income is not a livable income but in going, my opinion going from $120 a month to six to $800 a month cutting back on usage already in the coldest months of the year yep. uh, is, is there anything in place for our, our elderly people that's already paid their debt that they've already worked that you know some of these people are raising their grandchildren right. uh, what what kind of of help uh, are, are you talking about in these programs if you i may know, ask and in, in that specific case i'd be very interested to see if there was a way that we could help that specific customer Cindy mentioned, you know, that we do have customer service representatives that, you know, occasionally will visit homes to try to see what the problem is. But if they truly have cut back on usage and their bill was $120 but is now six or eight hundred, yeah, I don't I don't th there has to be some problem with their system, I would think. Yeah, I mean the fuel costs in the past year have been, you know, everybody's been talking about that all over the country. What the the fuel has done to uh, heating bills and electric bills, um, that's gone down a lot. Um, so hopefully that that has passed us. We won't see that now as the economy maybe will turn around in that area. But um, you know, as as we said, we're looking at programs that we can do. We have things in place. The number one thing that we could ask for you all to do is if you encounter a customer like that, then have them call us. As we said, we have customer service reps. We have the 24-hour call center too, but we have people in Kentucky who can go to their homes. And a lot of times it's people who are who are elderly and may not understand, and they'll look at their meter, they'll look at their heat pump. Um, but we need them to answer the phone when we call them and we need them to reach out and contact us is is there something specific or uh, that they should contact is there a number that they should go through yeah or? there's a 1-800 number and it's on the electric bills um i mean it's everywhere it's on our websites too but if it would be helpful um we could even prepare some cards for you all if you know for our eastern kentucky caucus if you wanted uh, to have a something you could hand to a constituent if they, I mean, we've done that in other jurisdictions. We'd be happy to, to provide that. I mean, that would, at least that would give you could hand physically hand something to a customer that they could take and uh, reach out to us. But um, certainly, we make ourselves available. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you, Senator Burke. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you all yeah. for coming. My, I have two questions. One actually follows right up on. Rep. Wesley's question um, about uh, programs that are available for um, your customers. Uh, it's, it's an idea couched in a question. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to tie receipt of LIHEAP or a Heart and Thaw or any of your programs to um, a conditional energy efficiency audit? Like, we will pay your outstanding amount if you let us come to your home and give you good light bulbs mm -hmm. um, so that your your next bill won't be like this is it possible to marry those two ideas uh, it, it may be possible i mean that's a good idea and we've talked about something similar as i said we've 
started just in the past few months talking about what we can do to help low income and what we can do to further provide assistance um, through our Heart and Thaw program. Uh, and we work with the community action agencies on all of that to administer that. So it, it, may, it may be possible. I mean, that's a, that's a good idea to, to, uh, for us to vet out. Um, the reason I that. ask that is my very first adult job was administering oh. <laughs> funds for like yeah. LIHEAP. Um, I worked at a rescue mission and yeah. we answered about people's $800 bills. Um, yeah. So we're putting yeah. the social workers on it might be a way that you all aren't even out of pocket. You already have these um, good energy efficient things and you can send yeah. community action to do the, the legwork. So that's just an idea. Yeah, I love, as a question. I love that idea. I don't know how community action might feel about taking on more work, but <laughs> I love the idea. <laughs> well, they want to see their their yeah. um, their people be helped. Yeah. So we have a great working relationship with them. And we're we're grateful for them. So um, yeah, we'll certainly consider that. As I said, we're we're trying to break down our customers and get as much data as we can on them and find out you know where the areas are that we can help them. I mean, I keep talking about housing, but um, I mean, that's there's a lack of data on housing. Uh, we've tried to find it. I mean, there's some out there, but I would like to have a lot more on, um, you know, county by county. On, so, um, you know, more to come on that. But yes, I appreciate that idea. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And then my other question, um, I really enjoyed hearing about um, the money you all are investing in economic development, in housing and in energy efficiency. My second question is about the economic development piece. Has any of the money that's been spent recently or is planned to be spent on econo economic development relating to developing sites for renewables? So I understand that closed coal plants can sometimes be turned into solar farms. Yeah. Is that something that's on your all's radar, either currently or for the future? Oh, it's definitely on our radar. We get um, inquiries a lot about people wanting to either build um, solar in our territory or um, ask us to consider being an off taker in it and it seems to be that's just increasing even this just this calendar year um, from an economic development standpoint I can't recall if we've given anything toward it from our KPEG probably not because uh, economic developers um, the the real economic developers from one East Kentucky and KAD and the cabinet I mean, they want they want to see long term permanent jobs, um, and sometimes solar farms don't do that. They don't. They, they know, it's not long term jobs or construction jobs. Um, but we do put a lot of money into the industrial parks, and you know, even if a we had a prospect that didn't work out in the Ashland area a couple years ago, but we provided the money through a grant to pave the road that led up to this building where they were considering locating. And so while the prospect didn't work out, that makes that site more marketable because we did provide that funding. Those are the kinds of kinds of projects that we're we're assisting with. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank, your yeah. time. Thanks. Ms. Cindy Burke, uh, I like your ideas on, on, on the LIHEAP tying mm -hmm. that to uh, maybe some energy audits, that sort of thing. Just want to let you know that next month, uh, this committee every year has to reauthorize that program or whatever, and we are going to have people here from a uh, lot and to be an excellent opportunity to, to mention that to them and and see for some way we could get that going thank you chairman yeah uh senator webb thank you mr chairman and uh, this senator smith's mom worked for power company but his dad like me was a coal miner so it's it's a little double personal for those of us who worked in the fossil industry and chose to do that, to sit here and see our power rates go from some of the lowest in the nation to my home where we sacrificed my brothers and sisters and myself, you know, to provide energy for the nation. So it's, it's, it's hard for me, this whole topic. I appreciate you all and everything you do for East Kentucky, but you know, you don't have to live with my mom. Her power bill, <laughs> you know, I've had y'all doing audits on my house. This isn't just a low income issue. This is for those of us who are in the middle class struggling every month. I, and I personally don't, I'm blessed more than most and I don't see how people are doing it. And we're gonna have people die. If we have another winter event, uh, like I referred to my district as the ice storm belt yesterday, I think, but you know, and that's what it is. Uh, you can't afford to you can't afford the power bill you know i've got properties that people can't rent 
because nobody, the tenants couldn't afford the power bill. And mm. it, it's, it's, it's an, creating an economic development issue in and of itself. You know, economic development can solve it, but it's also hindering the ability to try to solve it. And, you know, it, it's to, I'm a customer I'm, and, and it's, uh, you know, I could sit here all day and say, what was us stories, but you all hear them too. But it's, it's one of the top things and already chatter on Facebook about your rate hike, you know, and go, go to hazard and see what Brandon's talking about. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a problem. People have to live in shelters that are not adequate. An audit doesn't do any good unless you have the money to fix it. Yep. Amen. And our people are going to die, and we've got to come up with some better answers because they're going to be shutting off, going to be shutting off their power bills. They're going to be making choices about food and medicine, and I mean, it's just a reality. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what we're going to do, and I don't know what we're going what to tell people. And it just, it's very emotional for me. Yeah. Um, I understand that. I mean, it's, uh, I grew up in a coal camp too. Until I was 14, I had an orange cat that was black all the time. And, um, I, you know, so I, I get, I get that the history of it. And, um, I don't, I don't like to see what's happening either. Trust me. And, um, you know, I started the presentation by saying that we have challenges ahead of us and and that's truth and it's a f not just the, f the eastern kentucky situation is affecting the financial health of kentucky power which i have now have responsibility for and so um you know i heed the challenge that senator smith said about doing everything you can to do for economic development um and the population drain uh you know we will certainly do our part but we need you know we need partners we can't we can't change the economy by ourselves in eastern kentucky we will do what we can to uh mitigate rates for customers and then work with them to um, help them use electricity better and more efficiently so um love to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one since we're both in ashland and talk more about that sometime and try to come up with some some good ideas well and, and if i may mr uh chairman you know when i was when we had the Liberty discussion, some, I think there was a question earlier about what would have happened. I think we know what would have happened. Uh, you know, I wasn't real high on all that. But um, we did have discussions about solar, the potentiality of solar and utilization of some um, formerly mined lands for that with Liberty. Mm -hmm. And, I'll, you know, my caveat was keep it off my farmland, but <laughs> go ahead and see what you can do. <laughs> Is there any... Um, plans in the future for diversification of your portfolio along those lines that might uh, provide some relief to communities and rate payers? Yes, um, and probably what we need to do um, is get like a one pager of IRP and give it to you all and just for information so you would have that because that is before the commission now and through the course of the year you'll you'll be hearing more about that but um, that way you'll get to see it a snapshot of it's I think it's a couple hundred pages long so I don't think you want the whole report but it's out there on online anyway if you want it but um, yes we have um, plans to add renewables to our portfolio um, in the future and um, and more gas most likely you know at the end of the day it has to be the least cost option so uh, we can file an RP today and it could be different tomorrow depending on you know we just had new federal the 111D regulations that came down, and so those are still being figured out, and will maybe for a couple years. But you know that that also can change what we what we do going forward too. I, you know, I don't really we don't I don't know enough about it yet to know that for sure. But yep, thank you, Representative Flannery. Uh, two questions, please, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, uh, all the testimony that I've heard, not just today, but from last two three years on this committee is that we are not ready for the projected shift to electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems very consistent from uh, persons that, that work in this industry that are experts. Um, it appears to be that small modular reactors could, could be a help. Be curious what your thoughts are on that and uh, any possibilities that, that could be utilized to, to help maybe as a tool in the toolbox. Second, questions, uh, second question would be any estimate as to um, how many qualified uh, customers are not utilizing LIHEAP that, that may qualify? 
how I'm sorry, can you repeat the second question? Yeah, how, how many qualifying customers that would be LIHEAP eligible oh. are not not utilizing that program? Um, well, I'll ask, try to answer that one. I, I don't know the number of our customers who are not using LIHEAP who would be eligible for. I think the problem is that the run out of funding before everyone can take advantage of it. So that's why I say with our Heart and Thaw program, which is just Kentucky Powers program, we're looking at ways to add either more funding or to change the criteria so that more customers can take advantage of it. Um, and then from the, um, I'm not an EV expert, I'll admit, but um, I, you know, I'd, like I said earlier, I don't think the infrastructure is there yet, the charging infrastructure, and I don't think for us the, um, the demand in Kentucky, I mean, we, we have it on our list. I mean, we're looking at it. What we can we do to, you know, we, we want to be progressive too. We want to push this forward. So we want to make sure we're ready when people do say, I want an EV. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't think we're quite there yet. And then I think the, one of the questions uh, re referred to the small modular nuclear, the nuclear reactors. Yeah. And, and I do think that there's definitely potential there, but it seems that the, uh, uh, the process of uh, getting the permitting is still very long term, and yep. uh, it, it, it seems to me that even though there's great potential there, uh, it's not going to happen very quickly because of uh, the ability of permits and that sort of thing. Any comments on that? Well, I mean, so Amy's participating on the nuclear working group, and I'll let her talk about that, but, you know, any type of generation source, uh, as we were talking earlier, I mean, you know, when we were talking about scrubbing coal fire power plants a few years ago, you know, we're, we're talking about billions of dollars. And so that's hard to get your mind around when you're talking about that much money. And so anything with generation is expensive. It also takes a long time. So, uh, you know, permitting is one thing, but building, because we, we were looking at like possibly a, a a, ga a small gas uh, peaker plant or something for our property and our territory and you know it could be a it could take 10 years to get that built if we started today um, so uh, I think the nuclear is an intriguing option I think it um, could be an option I think it will come back to the cost but Cindy said I was participating on the nuclear working group I am not. We're very fortunate. One of our sister companies has real <laughs> experts that have worked at nuclear plants. <laughs> so I asked them to do it. Um, but we are excited about being a part of the conversation and, you know, fully participating in the working group. Mr. Chairman, I'm on that group and we'll have some recommendations, hopefully, for the next session. Great. Senator Smith? Yeah, I just, uh, if I could, wanted to point out that we do have the Public Service Commission uh, head back here with us, Commissioner. Kent Chandler, and we have one of our new members that was just confirmed by the Senate, uh, uh, former Representative Angie Haddon. I'd like to ask them to stand up and uh, let them be welcome from our committee. And also just say if you all have any comments, uh, you're welcome to, to make them. So yeah, welcome I'll to our committee. Yeah, I'll trade seats with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll usually make enough comments for both of us. Thank you. Wow, that's the first. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a Webster <laughs> County boy uh, uh, refusing to and comment so it's great no it's good to see y'all and and uh congratulations uh uh commissioner uh hatton so ladies i think that pretty much concludes the questions that we had for you we appreciate your uh presentation today and uh if unless anyone has anything else uh this meeting is adjourned thank you thank you